Let's ask a philosophical question. What is it that makes up a person's soul? Is it their personality, their memories, their emotions, the history of their good and bad deeds? Is it an energy that inhabits a living body, an active consciousness, or even all of the above? Or is the soul just an entirely nebulous and undefinable concept? The idea of the soul is almost as old as human civilization itself, with philosophers from as far back as ancient Greece and even before acknowledging its existence. Numerous religions from all over the world, if not all of them, also hold teachings about the nature of souls, even though they might vary. For example, Judaism and some denominations of Christianity state that only human beings have an immortal soul that will live on in heaven after a person's death and the end of their time on earth. Meanwhile, certain Catholic theologians, meaning people who study religion, claim that a soul inhabits all living creatures. And so the philosophical and theological debate goes on, with the general consensus being that souls are, well, they're a little bit of everything. Every part of someone that makes them who they are. Character, emotions, reasoning, consciousness, memories, and thoughts all blended together. But if we accept that a soul is something that exists, then it is something that can be altered. Is it constant or can it be manipulated? Could a person's soul even be removed entirely? At first glance, SCP-158 appears to be a device resembling a mechanical arm. In fact, it's a lot like the kind of machine you might expect to find inside a huge factory, standing as part of an assembly line, welding and drilling components together day in and day out. This particular mechanized arm, however, features a number of unique and bizarre differences from any currently used in automated production. For starters, it has an unusual attachment at one end, a three-pronged tridactyl-like claw. The arm itself is also designed to be suspended from the ceiling, ideally hanging upside down in a room big enough to accommodate it. There is a long series of winding cables connecting SCP-158 to a complicated computer console that is used to control the device, while the remaining cables are intended to be connected to a power source. As for the console, it possesses a visual display unit and a keyboard like you might expect it to. And at the bottom, there is what appears to be some form of a dispenser, seemingly designed to attach to a container of some kind, measuring 3 inches wide by 7 inches tall. The ideal receptacle to fit the attachment is that of a glass jar or beaker. This mechanical arm was first uncovered by the Foundation in late 2007, inside a burned-down hospital in an unknown location that has been redacted from the SCP-158 file. The hospital itself was derelict, abandoned, and appeared to have been unused for a considerable period of time. Approximately five years, but perhaps more. Agents working for the Foundation recovered SCP-158, along with an owner's manual that presumably would have contained detailed instructions describing the device's function and exactly how to operate it. This manual had been badly damaged by the fire, but the readable portions of it were later transcribed and copied, and now a single copy of what was left of the manual is kept with SCP-158 at all times. While most instructions detailing the operation of SCP-158 did survive and were able to be copied, any chapters that might have explained who built it or what it actually did were too badly damaged to read, lost to the fire. Much like the owner's manual, all components of SCP-158, the arm, the console, and the cables have all appeared to sustain some amount of fire damage, but remain intact and in full working order. The damage is only cosmetic, and while it might take around 20 minutes to boot up, this fire damage doesn't affect the machine's function. But the question still remains, what exactly is the intended purpose of this mechanical arm? Well, through a long process of trial and error, and following the surviving portions of the manual, the Foundation was able to get the device working again. They learned that SCP-158 will only perform its function when presented with an ordinary living being. While human beings, namely members of D-Class personnel, are typically used as test subjects by the Foundation, this actually applies to any living creature that has the ability to display cognition, which is the mental process of gaining knowledge, in order to perform cognitive functions like thinking, 
remembering, and problem solving. When a person or non-human being possessing cognition is presented to SCP-158, the machine will then go to work and extract an unknown gas-based substance from them. This substance is then deposited in the jar or beaker that is then fitted to the dispenser beneath the console. So, what does it take? Is it some sort of advanced form of decontamination device, removing all toxins and impurities from the body? Oh, if only that were true. Sadly, you see, the Foundation didn't give SCP-158 the nickname of the Soul Extractor for nothing. After the machine has performed its function, the now formerly cognitive organism on the receiving end will display a complete and total loss of their higher brain functions. They won't be able to speak, form coherent thoughts, or even remember who they were before SCP-158 was switched on. The device will rob them of any and all parts of themselves, essentially leaving the person or creature as a hollowed-out shell, a husk of their previous self, a body without a soul. Perhaps even crueler, though, is that this extraction process is not fatal, and victims are left alive afterward. They no longer possess their capability for cognitive thought, and will not respond to any form of external stimuli around them. There have been some level of brainstem activity recorded in most cases, and subjects have been known to exhibit basic reflexes, but this is the only active movement they are now capable of. As for that substance that test subjects have removed from their bodies, well, it takes the form of a gas, as we mentioned earlier, but it also seems to be comprised of a mixture of kinetic, electrical, heat, and light energy. In fact, each jar of the substance is an infinite source of these various types of energy, albeit only capable of a very low rate and output on average. The general consensus among Foundation researchers is that this substance is the physical soul that has been removed from a subject. So, do they stay stuck as soulless shells forever? Actually, SCP-158 is in fact capable of returning the extracted substance to a subject that it performed a removal on. However, whether a test subject, normally a member of D-Class, receives their soul after having it extracted is all down to whatever test is being conducted by the Foundation. Those that do get given their souls back will usually regain access to all of their previously lost cognition and higher brain functions, but the rate at which they can return can vary depending on the subject. Replacing the substance from one patient with that of another can also cause these results to differ. And again, that's if the SCP Foundation even bothers to replace a test subject's soul, instead of just leaving them hollowed out. It's actually pretty terrifying to think that the Foundation has the freedom and the capability to do that to somebody, taking away everything that makes someone a human being, only to leave their soul in a jar while their vacant body lives on without thought or consciousness. It was due to the unique, anomalous function of SCP-158 that the device was proposed to become a part of a Foundation research endeavor, codenamed the Olympia Project, and overseen by its head researcher, Professor Kane Pathos Crow, who has the head of a golden retriever, but that's a story for another day. The ultimate aim of the project was to use the anomalous properties of a number of SCPs to successfully create an artificial human that would become a potential asset of the SCP Foundation. As part of one series of Olympia Project experiments, Professor Crow gathered a group of D-Class personnel to undergo testing using SCP-158. Each of these individuals had been interviewed by Crow himself and were selected based on personality traits and characteristics that the professor liked or thought would be useful to have in the Foundation's artificial humanoid. The group chosen by Professor Crow featured a mix of male and female test subjects. As Crow believed, a soul transcends the flesh it is interred in. The main purpose of the experiment was to try and uncover some of the further functions of SCP-158, basically pushing the machine to its limit, trying to learn more information about the device that would have been contained in the damaged portions of the owner's manual. Professor Crow had pored over the sections that had survived intact, making sure he knew every available piece of information on SCP-158 inside and out. The obscured instructions he was able to decipher were, according to his notes, sketchy at best and downright unhelpful at worst. 
Crow began his experiments by removing the first subject's soul and then trying to use the device to do literally anything else with the extracted substance. Despite trying everything he could think of, the professor learned that there was little the soul extractor could do with the soul once it had been removed, other than reverse the process and return the substance to the body it had been taken from. By then repeating this with further D-class test subjects, Crow was able to learn the exact input sequence needed to reverse the soul extraction, whilst before this had only been ever achieved through blind luck. By his sixth experiment with SCP-158, Professor Crow noticed that there was a brief period in the middle of performing its function that the device would pause as if awaiting further commands. Crow theorized that this pause was there for additional sequences to be inputted via the machine's console. He then began removing and re-implanting the same soul into the following test subject, both to practice but also to experiment with the soul extractor's controls. The professor found it strange that, despite what he was doing to her, the D-Class suffered little to no side effects to her health, even though her soul was being continuously removed and replaced. Then, on experiment number 11, Crow seemed to crack that little pause SCP-158 took during each operation. A new list of commands appeared on the monitor like split, merge, remove aspects, add aspects, and combine aspects. It seemed to the professor that the device could be used to not only remove souls, but alter them. Through his further experiments, Crow learned that the aspects the machine mentioned were elements of a person's personality, such as willpower, understanding, conscience, creativity, empathy, and the soul extractor could be used to manipulate and rewrite a person's entire identity before placing it back into their body. However, this took a considerable amount of testing, causing Professor Crow to grow more and more frustrated with the complex workings of the device. That was until he eventually realized it wasn't SCP-158 that was too complicated for its own good. The machine was trying to quantify the unquantifiable, explain something inexplicable, the very nature of the human soul. Professor Crow began using SCP-158 to modify a composite soul, which he referred to as Subject Zero. While working on it, he realized the soul itself seemed to be aware of its surroundings, possessing a level of knowledge above that of most Foundation researchers, including Crow himself. Either by fluke or by meddling with SCP-158, the professor had created a soul that seemed to exist on several planes of existence beyond the physical world that we know. Subject Zero had become a sentient, disembodied consciousness, an entity that could see, hear, feel, and think without the need for a physical form or body to house it. Zero was proposed to become Professor Crow's assistant, given that it displayed respect and admiration to him for having created it, almost like a child looking up to a father figure. All it asked in return was to be given a name other than Subject Zero. Crow told the disembodied entity it could name itself whatever it liked. The Foundation then planned for the composite soul, now formally known as Subject Zero, to be a component of the Olympia Project's artificial humanoid, whenever its creation was successfully completed. Don't you just love a happy ending? Now go check out Living Ice Cream Van SCP-1386 and SCP-261 Pandimensional Vending Machine for more peculiar, anomalous machines from the SCP Foundation.